Number 10. Aurora's Hypnosis and Sleeping Beauty. Another one of Disney's early classics, which I wasn't prepared for. Up until now, Princess Aurora, or Rose, depending on who you ask, has been successfully hidden away from the evil Maleficent. At least until her 16th birthday, when she's returned to her kingdom to marry Prince Philip. Uh, yeah, the, that age poorly. While the three good fairies leave the room to discuss their next actions, little do they know, Aurora is not alone. This scene is certainly unnerving. Maleficent appears in the fireplace as a ball of green light, which hypnotizes Aurora, leads her through a hidden labyrinth, and eventually to an evil spinning wheel to prick her finger. The good fairies eventually start to pursue her, but it's too late. Touch the spindle. Touch it, I say. The reason why I put this ahead of Snow White's build-up is pretty simple. It's both quieter and louder in scarier ways. Throughout this scene, Aurora is hypnotized, blankly and silently led away, all while that creepy music plays in the background. That music's chord was enough to make me flinch. <laughs> oh god, every time. And just like with Snow White, it was only a matter of time until Aurora doomed herself. What made this even scarier for me was the next couple of times that I watched it. I first watched this during the day on a small VHS screen, but when I watched this movie again at night, I began noticing the smaller details. The fact that Aurora doesn't blink throughout this whole thing, the fact that the music sounds like it's saying her name, and creepiest of all, Maleficent appearing behind that light. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty. Proof that Maleficent is still one of Disney's greatest villains. No, not that one! That's better. Oh, simple fools. <laughs> Number 9. The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack. This 2009 Cartoon Network show was about a young kid named Flapjack who dreams of journeying to Candy Island, with his pirate friend Captain Knuckles and their whale transporter friend, Bubby. But don't let the cutesy exterior fool you. This show is horrifying. Whoever decided to make this show was clearly off their rocker. There is nightmarish imagery and dark themes everywhere, and every one of them is unique and unsettling. There's that episode where Flapjack adopts a pet rat and gives everyone the plague. There are jump cuts and jump scares galore. And there's this creepy guy. You need to grow up. Grow up? I'm 38 years old. <laughs> Why? This show was trying to become the next Courage the Cowardly Dog, a show that primarily feeds on children's fears. Many people have episodes of Courage the Cowardly Dog on these lists, but surprisingly, I don't. I was lucky enough to not see the scariest episodes from Courage. It was Flapjack who took that spot for me, and in all honesty, I think Flapjack is scarier than Courage. Now I know, I know, I know that's a bold statement to make, but think about this for a second. During the intro of Courage the Cowardly Dog, we are specifically told that this show is going to be scary, so therefore, we know what to expect. But creepy stuff happens in nowhere. It's up to Courage to save his new home! Flapjack, on the other hand, said nothing! This, my friends, is false advertising. So naturally, you're caught more off guard by moments like this. Hey look, a little cut. Oh. Ah! Oh, the Misadventures of Flapjack. Misadventures is an understatement. Number 8. Ah, uh, P. 
Pete's Dragon. For some reason, I used to watch this movie all the time as a kid. The story of a young boy and his invisible, fire-breathing dragon, Elliot, sounds harmless enough. But the opening to this movie, I always end up skipping. Not because the credits were long and boring or anything. I'll get to that shortly. Anyway, it starts off with our hero Pete riding on the back of the invisible Elliot in the woods. Pete hears someone coming and goes to hide, where we're greeted by- Gah! Who are you? You don't look friendly. Gah! Creepy woman! Maybe they sound nice- ah! Mommy! <sighs> Meet the Gogans. Pete's adopted family. They're the reason he's out in the woods. He's running away from them. And I don't blame him. They look dirty, they look nasty, with personalities to match. No kid wants to encounter these sorts of growling strangers late at night. And what makes them even worse is their song in the original extended edition, where they basically lie to Pete that they'll treat him better while thinking up all the tortures they plan on dishing out to him. Gonna call him. On top of that, they jump in all scary like later on in the movie. But there were two things that helped me conquer my fears of them. One is that most of the rest of their scenes are played for laughs. And the other thing is, their scary opening song doesn't appear in most modern cuts of the film. The modern cut trims away some of the scarier scenes and scenes that drag out too long. Unbelievably, many of these moments I skipped through anyway as a kid, so it was a really welcome change. Sure, we lose the candle on the water scene, but to be fair, that was a pretty boring scene to look at. I mean, she just stands there. Nothing else. The Gogans. Talk about stranger danger. Number 7. I watched The Jungle Book as a kid, and I rather enjoyed it. But believe it or not, this next entry on my list has nothing to do with The Jungle Book movie. Well, sorta. Let me explain. The specific Jungle Book VHS I had was the cause of the problem. Now, most of Disney's earlier movies had no end credits. The credits were mainly at the start of the movie, while the endings were relatively short and abrupt. Now at this point in time, I couldn't find the TV remote, so I had to wait for the very end of the tape for it to rewind. Once the movie ended, I saw ads for new things, like a new unfamiliar property called The Muppets. Now at this point, I was okay with puppet shows, but I was a really young kid, so I wasn't aware that puppets could be used in a violent way, as well as a tame way. The ad was just a Kermit and Miss Piggy skit talking about their recent holiday. But then things go crazy in a bad way. Now, to a regular Muppet fan, you'll probably learn to expect this type of humor, because you know what to expect. But to a little kid who knew nothing, this is how I saw this scene. Uh -huh. <laughs> what? Why would you... You can't just... Again, if you knew nothing about the Muppets until now, you'd probably think along the same lines as my childhood self. As a kid who got spanked on a regular basis, this scene of Miss Piggy slapping Kermit across the room wasn't funny. That looked painful. It didn't give me time to process anything. And that final shot of Gonzo blowing his head off was the final nail in the coffin. This happened far too quickly. I thought he was holding a gun. I didn't know he was holding a trumpet. This was too much for me to handle, and it took me five years to accept that Gonzo performs these kind of stunts all the time. Makes you wonder why I love Muppet Treasure Island now, doesn't it? So as a result, I dreaded watching the ending to The Jungle Book, fearing that that ad would be there at the end of every time that movie aired. So, here's how the ending to The Jungle Book played out throughout my childhood. Well, come on, baggy buddy. Let's get back to- Rewind.
Number 6 The Opening to Toy Story 2 You're my favorite deputy! Ah, Toy Story 1. The definition of a classic. This was one of the first movies I ever saw and I was lucky enough to have just that one movie as part of my childhood. So naturally, when I discovered there was a second movie a few years later, I was naturally excited. So one day, I sat down to watch. Again, I couldn't even make it past the opening. Toy Story 2 opens up with Buzz Lightyear flying through space to an alien planet to hunt down his archenemy, the evil Emperor Zurg. Okay... Already a confusing opening to a little kid. I knew where the last movie took place, and it certainly wasn't space. I had no concept of backstories. The more this scene went on, the more confused I became. Eventually Buzz finds Emperor Zurg himself. So naturally they fight, but then... No! This scene traumatized me. You grow up with this amazing toy hero for years, just to witness him being blasted in two by this complete nobody. That's like building up a deep, relatable character in one property, only to have him killed off at the start of the next property. Huh? Yeah, just like that. Now, imagine your anger in The Last of Us 2's opening, and channel that into the mind of a little kid watching Toy Story 2 for the first time. This scene scared me so bad I ran out the room like a dart, just missing the reveal that it was Rex playing a Buzz Lightyear video game the whole time. And because I didn't see that video game reveal in time, I didn't watch Toy Story 2 again until many years later. Don't believe me? Ask a group of kids if they want to watch Toy Story 2, and if any of them are in tears, begging you not to put it on, they know how I feel, because they feel the same way. This blurred the line between reality and fiction to me, but this would become a common way to open all Toy Story movies from now on. The opening to Toy Story 2. Didn't I mention my childhood was officially dead? <laughs>